You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I am also mom to three kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. I'm going to remind you throughout the show, you can give us a call and ask any question live on air. The number is 866-451-1451. We are continuing our Mama Docs on Call series where I introduce you to physicians who are also moms like me. They're here to provide information, support really geared to you and your family. And today we are welcoming Dr. Ritu Jane, who, you know, she she does a lot. She is a hospitalist. She's also, she does real estate development, which total like 180, but she does it. And she's a mom and she's a wife and she travels a lot. Not only does she travel, but she actually enjoys traveling with her little guy, which I, for one, find incredibly impressive because full disclosure when I traveled with my when I had one child and I remember traveling with him to Europe and I swore never again so we're going to find out (laughs) how she enjoys traveling with her little one Um, and we're going to talk today about balance right how does she do it all how does she balance work and life and Still stay healthy. You know, lots to talk about. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. I'm so excited to be on. So let's start with the professional stuff. Um, What is a hospitalist? Sure. So the concept of a hospitalist is actually fairly new. Um, And it's a physician who primarily practices only in the hospital. Um, and so as a hospitalist, I am a board certified internal medicine physician, um, and I take care of the most acute patients. Um, so those who come into the emergency room and who unfortunately are not able to go back home that same evening, um, patients that might need ICU care, intensive, um, care unit, um, maybe they've suffered from a heart attack. Um, so those are the patients, the most acute patients, um, in the hospital. And do you do any follow-up care? I do not. I only work in the hospital, um, so I do not see anyone in the outpatient or clinical setting, uh, clinic setting. Um, But um, I do have a network of physicians with whom I work, and I'm able to refer to them um, so that they can assume care once the patients are out of um, the hospital. And in general, how long do people stay? I guess it depends, obviously, on why they're there. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the hospital stay is, it can vary from anywhere from for 24 hours um, up to multiple days, depending on the severity uh, that brought them into the hospital. Um, so, for example, a typical day might mean that I'm taking care of a patient who has suffered um, a heart attack um, and then one that maybe has a stroke and one perhaps that was um, 
in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, and then maybe someone who ran the LA Marathon just you know a few days ago and who might come in dehydrated. So um, depending on the severity and what sort of needs they have, again, 24 hours would probably be the shortest day, and then we're looking at multiple days thereafter. How did you decide to go into this specific form of medicine? I find internal medicine um, to be very interesting, and I'm lucky that I'm able to practice in this capacity. Um, I love the variety of patients that we get to see, um, and, I, and I really do love the acuity um, that hospital medicine gives. Um, we're seeing patients who are very vulnerable at the moment, uh, at maybe their most vulnerable moment, um, and, I, and I'm able to see them and um, have their trust that we are able to heal them, um, of course, in a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and that's really the reason why I chose internal medicine and specifically to be a hospitalist. I feel like when I was in, in med school, I don't, I don't recall hospitalists as being a specific, I mean, maybe it was, but I don't recall it being a named entity as much. Is it a newer subspecialty? Yeah, so I think the concept of hospitalist was coined about 1996 is what I was told um, by one of our medical journals. Um, and it was the concept that a physician would stay and remain in the hospital to address all of the ever-changing issues that a patient might have in their most vulnerable and acute setting, which would be the hospital. Um, I think the traditional model would be a physician would have his outpatient practice and then also would make rounds in the hospital, which would mean that many times the physician would not be physically present in the hospital if something were to occur, unfortunately, um, just by design. Um, and so I think this, this new concept allows for us to be present for anything that may arise, whether small or big. And who, who or really, you said that, I mean, there's a wide variety of patients that you see, but I have to imagine there's got to be some some things that you see more often than not. Um, is there anything that you kind of see bread and butter wise? Sure. Yes. Um, so we see a lot of patients who come in with chest pain um, that may be concerning initially for a heart attack that ends up being not a heart attack. Um, and we also see many patients who come in with stroke-like symptoms, something that we label transient ischemic attack or TIA, um, that those are not a full stroke, but maybe a precursor to a stroke in the future. Um, and I'm mentioning these two specifically because there is a lot to be said about prevention. Um, and I love when I'm able to see these patients and sort of guide them and educate them about how they may prevent a stroke from happening, for example, in the future, um, based off of what we call lifestyle modification. So healthy eating, uh, being able to exercise on a regular basis. Um, that's really where I, where my interests are, are to educate my patients to make it into the hospital, um, to teach them how maybe to prevent a future hospitalization. And how much do you get families involved in that? So often. And it is a joy when I see families come and take an active part in my patient's care. Um, because as we know as moms, it really does take a village. And it takes a village to heal, and it takes a village to break old habits sometimes. Um, so when I have a mom who's so busy um, and is not able to take care of herself and is perhaps eating too much junk food, for example, or not exercising enough, I really do look forward to speaking with her children or maybe her spouse and asking for their help to keep her on track. And how are we supposed to care for our families if we're not caring for ourselves first? And especially with being a mother, it's so important because I feel most of our time, much of our time is dedicated to helping our family. Um, and we may forget about taking care of ourselves. So family support has been instrumental in many of my discussions with my um, patients. Um, and so I, I encourage all of us, if we can, and we have that ability to do that, um, to be there for our families, to help them through the healing process. 
And you mentioned um, TIAs, and so if someone does have a stroke, do they go to neurology, or do you take care of that as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, that's what I mentioned. It's a multidisciplinary team. So um, every hospital has a different way to do things. Um, my hospital approaches it as um, the physician the hospitalist will take care of all the patients, and then the neurologist will be as a consult, consult um, which is really wonderful because I'm able to work with my neurology colleagues, um, and I'm able to, you know, have them um, do their tests and, and, and their education, but then I'm also able to come in with my medicine, my, my internal medicine aspect, and, and educate. So uh, we work as a team. That's how we. That's how my hospital approaches it. You, I mean, that you have to be up on so much. I mean, you need to know. Gosh, basically everything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> from a medical standpoint, like it, it must be a lot to keep track of. It's it's a lot, um, and that's the beauty of it. Um, we're really able to see diseases on all levels. Um, you know, I only take care of adults, but within the old adult realm, I'm able to see things like the heart, the kidneys, the lungs, the brain. Um, and it and it's so interesting and it keeps it makes for a very dynamic work environment. Yeah. And you're also covering the ICU. Correct. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's wow. probably my favorite place to be. Um, our patients are so ill, um, and and if we are able to intervene at that moment and maybe help someone, um, that's the most beautiful feeling in my world, at least. One of the most beautiful feelings, I should say, other than being a mom, and, of course. <laughs> of course. Now, in terms of lifestyle, and what are your top, you know, in terms of things that you tend to <clears throat> recommend frequently. You said the exercise and dietary things. Are there commonalities between um, various disease processes that you see often? And you know, you were saying not eating well, uh, you know, junk food, etc. Are there common suggestions that you tend to make? I do, and this is such an important part of what I believe I do, um, which is how do we prevent coming into the hospital? Um, and especially as a mom, when we may not have a whole lot of time for ourselves. Um, so what I tell my patients are things that they can do that feel a little bit more approachable. So if I'm to say, go to full cycle every day, that may not happen. But if I'm to say 30 minutes of any activity a day, at least five times a week, and that might include maybe opting to take the stairs in case, instead of the elevator in your office, or perhaps um, if you need to go get some milk, you may consider going with your baby in their stro in the stroller and taking a walk instead if it's close enough. Um, so what I recommend, again, 30 minutes of activity at least five times a day, um, and you can break that up. It doesn't have to be 30 sequential minutes. It can be maybe three times, you know, 10 minutes times three. Um, and so that's something that I think a lot of us may be able to incorporate into our lives. Um, and the other one is, maybe meal prep. So I know that the times where I may not eat the best is when I haven't necessarily prepared something for the week of. So perhaps you can just have a day or maybe you can help ask for help from your spouse or a friend to bring over groceries or now they have those apps um, where you can call in and get things delivered to your home yeah. if that's available to you. Um, so that maybe instead of opting for the chips, you may have some cut up celery with some peanut butter that you may opt for instead. Um, so things that feel to me that are much more approachable than these huge lifestyle changes, um, because I think it's the small things that we do on a regular basis that really amount to good health. And I saw on your Instagram account, you're a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you recommend that for your patients? You know, vegetarianism was, was something that is a very personal decision. Um, it's actually partly due to religion, but as an adult has become more a part of what I believe outside of religion as well. Um, I, I don't necessarily prescribe that to my patients. What I do say, though, is to focus in on a well-balanced, low-fat diet um, consisting of lots and fruits and vegetables, 
and whole grains. Um, you'd want to chew the diet that's low in saturated fat, low in cholesterol, um, I would say moderate in sugar, salt, and total fat. So um, fish is a really great source of protein. Um, I, I, I highly recommend that for patients if they if they would like to um, have protein, maybe up for fish instead of red meat. Um, so leaner choices in that way would really help, um, I think, for the overall heart health is what we like to call it. Well, we have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to Dr. Ritu Jane. And when we come back, we are going to learn some more healthy tips and we're going to learn about real estate development. I'm super excited. Stay with us. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Dr. Ritu Jane. And remember, if you have a question, give us a call, 866-451-1451. So just before the break, we were talking about dietary choices. Um, and, you know, so fish is uh, healthy, but, you know, people get very anxious I think about which fish and Mm -hmm. is there a healthier fish and you know when that comes up what if it comes up you know do you have any suggestions on that you know people talk about for example sardines are actually really healthy but they're kind of not always everyone's favorite Uh, whereas you know people tend to like swordfish but it's actually really not particularly great for you because it's really high in mercury like how do you suggest people because we're neither of us are nutritionists but at the same time you you're in a really excellent position when people are in the hospital to really advise them on health so how do you go about that absolutely I, my approach is, you know, we, I, I don't know all of the varieties, for example, of fish. Um, more importantly, where you live actually really does dictate what type of fish you may have. Um, and so if you have access to the ocean, that might be different than if you're landlocked and vice versa. And we do have many patients, especially in Los Angeles, who are actually not native. Um, they may be here for vacation and unfortunately suffer some sort of illness and then are under my care. So I have to be... Um, I have to meet the patient where they may be, and geographically, it doesn't make sense for me to recommend something that they are not having to their disposal. So what I like to say in general is do your research. Um, you know, do seasonal varieties of fish. Um, I think that if, and also in moderation, perhaps a full diet, a diet only of 100% fish is probably not going to be that healthy, um, just in the same way that, um, you know, any one thing, taken out of moderation can be harmful. Um, and so I, to, to say a specific fish, I don't really have a recommendation. I do like salmon. I don't eat it myself, but I do end up recommending that to many of my patients. Um, and if you can and you have the financial means, perhaps something that's you know, fresh, um, more fresh than, than frozen would be helpful. Um, also be careful of preparation. So if you are eating fish but it's always fried, perhaps that's not the right option for you. Um, Perhaps you should opt for something that's grilled. Um, And so preparation, very, very important. 
Um, you mentioned sardines. Um, I think if you were to eat fresh sardines, that's probably very healthy. However, often sardines are packed and preserved in a lot of salt. So for my patients, for example, who may have hypertension or congestive heart failure, that would not be a great option for them. Um, and so preparation really is where I focus on. Uh, and then the fish, you would just have to, you know, see what you have seasonal in your location. That makes a lot of sense. Now, what about, you know, um, I have to imagine, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you probably don't have too many moms, young moms coming in with acute illness. I'm sure there are some, but it must be something of a rarity in so much that, you know, they're relatively healthy, um, hopefully. But it happens. Yet, I think a lot of moms, at least in my experience, you know, people don't feel their best, right? People are strapped for time. People don't, moms, young moms, don't always feel like they have the, the opportunity to take as good care of themselves as they should or would like to. Um, you know, so they're not actually inherently ill, but they also don't feel great. You know, and what tips do you have for those moms? Absolutely. And I, and I believe that that's something that most or many women can relate to, especially Um, as a new mother, I I certainly can. Um, You have your great days and you have some really terrible days where you maybe are sleep deprived um, or your child is sick so you know or you're worrying about him or her. Um, My my biggest tips are the first thing is if you don't care for yourself you are not able to care for someone else. Um, So you really have to focus your attention on trying your best to be the best you you can be and that includes self-care um and so we may not always have time for self-care and i recognize that but maybe a few minutes here and there so um if you're able to in your commute um maybe connect with with people that bring you joy um if that's something that will bring you joy and bring you happiness um connection has been really important for me as a new mom um Feeling like I'm not alone sometimes um, has also been really helpful. So the mom tribe, for example, has been so instrumental in in my mental health, which I think contributes a lot to physical health. Um, It's definitely part of of how we feel and how we are as as healthy human beings. Um, So that's one tip. But another tip is maybe just getting out. Um, Like I said, in my postpartum moments, I felt cooped up and I was feeling not very good because I wasn't able to exercise the way I routinely do. Um, But taking my stroller out and going for a walk did a few things. First is I was able to connect with my son. I was able to show him the birds and the trees and that was a way for us to bond. Second, I'm getting in cardio, which felt great. Um, Third is I met some great cool moms on my stroll. So you're connecting there as well. Um, So maybe just a Stroll around the block if you have no other time, 10 minutes maybe, a few times a week, that can be very helpful. And another tip that I have is YouTube. If you have a few minutes and your child is sleeping, maybe do a 10-minute workout on YouTube. You don't need anything else. Most everyone has a smartphone. Open it up to YouTube and do a little workout. Um, So those are some quick and easy tips. Um, You know, also sleep. Sleep when your baby sleeps. Um, catch up on that. You know, it may not be all eight hours, but if you're able to catch 10 minutes here and there, that might help re-energize for a little while. Absolutely. And sleep is so important. And lack of sleep is profoundly detrimental. God Absolutely. knows. Um, now, what do you think of the mommy culture around alcohol? Um especially on social media and what have you, there's a spin towards, you know, it's four o'clock somewhere. I'm going to have a glass of wine because being a mom is so hard. Um, From a mom standpoint, from a physician standpoint, what do you think of it? Yeah, I'm so glad that you're bringing this up. Um, It's, 
you know, I, I laugh because some of it is a little bit funny, and I think it's meant to be that way. But as a physician, I worry very, very severely about this culture that is normalizing um, um, drinking maybe every day. Um, so, again, I believe in alcohol in moderation. Um, I don't mind maybe a glass or two throughout the whole week. So that's one or two glasses a week. Um, but what I think becomes problematic from a physician standpoint and from a health standpoint is consuming multiple glasses of wine or any other type of alcohol on a daily basis. Um, not only is that detrimental to health, um, it's also detrimental to being a good mom and being a, there for your child and being there for your spouse. Again, I will mention it again, you have to take care of yourself in order to take care of your child, ultimately. Um, so from a physician standpoint, um, we recommend no more than one or two glasses of alcohol a week. And when I mean glasses, of, I mean glasses of wine or small, you know, uh, low, low um, uh, volume of alcohol, one to two glasses a week. Um, and it concerns me when there are uh, memes and other things that are saying full bottles of wine. Um, I think what that means to me, though, is that there is a lack of support for our moms out there. Um, what I found to be very helpful is I'm part of a group of mothers locally, and we have an ongoing discussion about things that are scary or nerve-wracking or funny. Um, and that's been really helpful for me. So I think people support would be really helpful in trying to decrease our need to um, engage in, in deleterious alcoholic um, consumption. Now, you're in L.A., and it, have you found a big um, marijuana use? I mean, is there a lot of – because in New York, it, it's really not yet – a big thing here. I mean, obviously amongst teenagers, you know, but in, it's not so readily available yet that at least in my patient population, you know, I don't see young moms, you know, smoking pot or having edibles to kind of in the same way that they're drinking a glass of wine, but out West it's far more available. Have you seen any uptick or, or, you know, either amongst people talking about it or in the ER with sure um, what I what I have what I have seen is um, since the legalization of, of marijuana here in California I've seen um, many more stores and um, sort of distributors pop up in my area um, I have not seen necessarily an uptick in patients who make it into the emergency room for marijuana related illnesses um, but I, I am anticipating that that may happen. Um, I have been asked about CBD oil, um, things that I, I have yet to learn about. But um, those, I am starting to feel that there's a discussion. I have not yet seen it materialize, however, in my own practice. I've seen it sort of in social media more than my own practice. It's definitely, it's definitely brewing. I will agree. You know. Absolutely. Um, it's there, it's somewhere. Um, now what, tell us about now switching gears completely real estate. How, I mean, how did you get into real estate and what do you do within the world of real estate? Sure. Um, so it's, it's always been a passion of mine to, um, create something, um, in the real estate sector, my parents, I sort of was born into a family of entrepreneurs who also partake in real estate development. So it was kind of an easy segue for me. Um, but personally, it's, it's been very interesting putting my mind into something other than medicine. Um, we trained for so many years in medicine, and it's truly my passion. Um, and, it, and being able to do uh, something that's a different part of my brain, using a different part of my brain has been really, um, really exciting um, and, and uh, one that's been very fun for me. Um, so that's how we got into it. It was just an easy segue. My, my family business, my, my family was in that type of business and it was sort of um, an easy segue for me. 
And so you guys, what specifically have you been doing? Yeah. So um, we do real estate in all capacity. Um, Oh, you um, know what? Hold that thought. And I'm going to, after the break, we will discuss. So you're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center. And after the break, we are going to learn what Dr. Jane does in real estate. Don't go away. There are artists and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians, and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Les Col des Beaux-Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20-year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit www.asmarart.com, www.aliceasmarinternational.com and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and IR Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to Dr. Ritu Jane. And you can give us a call if you have a question, 866-451-1451. So just before the break, I was asking about your real estate endeavors. Um, and then I cut you off. for that. So why don't you tell us what exactly you do in real estate? So it's really just a hobby, Um, you know, finding time outside of medicine and outside of being a mother, um, it has to make sense. It has to feel organic and you have to want to do it, you know, when you don't have a whole lot of time outside of your busy career as a physician and, and of course, as a mom. Um, So what I do is I just, it's it's sort of a passion project. So if I like something and, you know, we find a home, for example, that we love, we may fix it up. Um, If it makes sense, then we may rent it out. If it doesn't make sense, then we, you know, can renovate and then we sell. Um, it's a great way to, if you are to rent it, it's a great way for physicians to, and, and other career people who may be busy with their uh, primary career, um, for passive income. Um, so you may want to, um, I, for example, wanted a way to have passive income and then actively have my income at the hospital. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's really just a hobby. If it's not something that um, that I forced and was forced into, it was something that just was interesting to me, and so um, that's how it started. It's it must fun. be a nice outlet from a design standpoint, you know. I mean, I think in medicine where we are forced, and and I think we're trained to use um, obviously evidence based medicine, like we're very concrete in a lot of ways. I mean, we get to think outside the box in terms of what's a diagnosis, et cetera. But, you know, and we, I always think about it as like painting a picture, you know, but we don't literally get to paint pictures. Uh, (laughs) But in real estate, you must be able to kind of, it must be a cool creative outlet. That's, 
what my that's one of my most favorite parts of what I do is being able to use that part that's been dormant for a very long time. We're, we're creative as physicians because, like you said, we are doing detective work often, um, but it's not in the same way. And I do have a passion for design. So when I see a home that may need a little bit of TLC, um, to be able to um, create something like that and to see the end product has been very, very interesting and so much fun. Um, and I'm lucky that I get to share in that with my family. With my husband, we're able to do a project together. Um, and that's been really nice too, because that's been a great way for us to reconnect um, and to talk about something um, that we both really enjoy doing together. So it's been, it's been very nice also just as a, in our, in our marriage, it's been a really nice added um, fun thing to do. Well, and that brings us to, you know, it's a great segue to say you're a new mom and you, I mean, on Instagram, it looks like you've been traveling a lot since having a baby, but you've opted to travel with your baby. How Mm -hmm. have you found in terms of kind of prioritizing your marriage and your baby and traveling? Like, it seems like you're doing so much. How are you balancing it all? Yeah, so the first thing that I learned about balance is that it's not 50-50. There's some days where you're spending, you know, 90-10 and you're not able to do everything that you wanted that was on your list. And that's okay. That has to be okay. Um, And the guilt associated with not being able to complete the task really has to take a backseat really has to go away. So that's the first thing that I've learned. Um, And the second thing is, it's so important for us as parents and my family to expose our child to as much diversity as we can. Um, And that's been a priority. An added bonus is that both my husband and I love to travel and we also do it for work, um, for a real estate part of it. So um, it becomes a really great family adventure when we're able to incorporate those three elements of wanting to expose our child to different areas of the world if we can, um, working and also spending time together as a couple. Um, it's, there, are, there are challenges, of course, um, and, and plans don't always go the way they're supposed to. Um, and so, but we have to be okay with that. And in fact, it's sometimes the funniest parts where we're supposed to, en route to a museum, we have a poop explosion and we <laughs> detour to a cafe that ends up being the coolest cafe we've gone to. Um, so we've noticed that now with our travels that we do have sort of a skeleton of a schedule, um, but we allow for a lot of detouring. Um, and that's really helped bring down anxiety in terms of all the things that are needing to happen that goes out the door. And what ends up happening is you just have this organic sort of flowing trip that ends up being very personalized and, and really nice. Less pressure. That's, I mean, that sounds awesome. I, I should take a, a card from your playbook. Um, <laughs> and do you guys travel with your family as well? Sometimes. Um, so we've gone, we've gone recently, just recently we went to Japan and I was lucky enough to have my family and that was really wonderful. Um, so we have built in babysitters, not to say that our parents are not (laughs) appreciated in other ways, but, um, that's really wonderful. So my husband and I were able to travel for a few days without baby, um, in this grand, grander, bigger family trip. Um, so it kind of felt like a nice escape, but we have traveled just the three of us, my husband, my son, and I, um, and that's also been really beautiful. Um, what we've done in those situations are a little different. Uh, we do some research prior to going, um, abroad and we find a babysitter locally. Um, and then we're able to maybe have a night, one dinner by ourselves, just the two of us. Um, so we make it work. Um, and it's really lovely spending that time with my child, with our children, with our child too, being able to travel and show him sights. I mean, he's only one, um, but I think that the sooner we get him exposed to different things and to feeling a little uncomfortable, the more he it'll hopefully be natural to him um, later in life. Absolutely, and Japan, I very high on my bucket list is skiing in Japan. And oh, going to Japan in general, but um, I would love to ski in Japan. And 
I have friends who just did the, the um, Tokyo Marathon, which looks pretty awesome. Although, oh, wow. Yeah. Although I think the time change, I, from a functional standpoint, it may not be the, I mean, they all seem to do it fine, but I think I would have a hard time. <laughs> um, but it looks like an amazing, amazing place. It truly is. Just, a long trip. I mean, I guess from L.A. it's not as bad, but still, you, you need a long time to go to Japan. I mean, it, there's yes. lots to see also. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, have you found that in terms of, I mean, I think a lot of people when they travel with a baby get very anxious about things like naps and time change and, you know, airplanes and stuff like that. How did you manage that for yourself sure um absolutely the anxiety is very real um i can't say that i didn't i didn't feel anxious the first few times that we flew um but what we what we do is we try our best to adjust very quickly if we can to the time change so um on in route to japan we slept when it was supposed to be evening in japan so that when we landed hopefully our transition is not so bad. Uh, we were lucky enough that that was the case going to Japan. On the way back, we all sort of suffered from jet lag, um, which for me was okay because we're at home. And so I can deal with whatever we have to deal with. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, lots of snacks. <laughs> you know, when you're on the flight and your child is getting a little squirmish, you give him some snacks, you find ways to entertain. Um, that's another thing. And, um, you know, you, you just roll with the punches. That's really the only, the only specific recommendation that I have. Um, if your baby is tired, you take a nap then, um, you know, if he's hungry, you do that. And so that for me, that is the beauty of travel is that all the rules sort of go by the wayside and what you have in front of you is what you need to take care of. And that's it. Um, and so you just make it work. And that's sort of been our philosophy. So like I say, if we were scheduled to go to a museum and in fact, now we can't, that's okay. You know, we'll detour, we'll go some other time if we can. And the journey is really the, a beautiful part of it. It doesn't have to be about the destination necessarily. I think that is such a wonderful message because uh, too often people get very, very, very obsessive about the nap schedule and the sleep schedule and, you know, and the, the anxiety gets so ratcheted up that the entire experience really gets lost in the interest of keeping a child on a schedule, which frankly is going to go out the window anyway, in short (laughs) order, because kids like their sleep schedules change. Um, I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, Has there been anything about motherhood where you're like shocked, where you're like, wow, I really completely did not anticipate any of this. Um, You know, I think most of it is just your relationship um, with yourself with your partner, with your family. That's been the most surprising part of motherhood um, in, in beautiful ways. Um, I'm much more connected to myself um, than I've ever been. It took me a while, but I am now. Um, I'm, and I'm much more connected to myself um, than I've ever been. Um, but, you know, and, and the flip side of that is not always so beautiful. The flip side is sometimes you're frustrated, um, maybe because of lack of sleep or maybe because of something else. And you may um, you may have some conflict with your with your spouse or with a family member because they may not understand where you're coming from. So I think that for me was the hardest part is just the changes in your personal uh, excuse me, in your personal relationships with people with yourself um, and the role that you now play as a mother, which is the greatest role of all time in my opinion. Um, but with that comes a lot of expectation and a lot of self sort of imposed expectation as well. Um, um, but it's, it's in general, I feel that once you start, once I started to recognize that I may not be able to do everything that's on my list, because um, as many of us are, we're very type A and many, in our profession, many of us are like that. And I think a lot of people might be. Um, once I started to sort of break that down 
and and sort of go with the flow and see where my child is and how he what he needs of me for that day, um, it started to be a little bit easier for me um, to accept my changes. That is a very good message to take us to a break. You're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and after the break, we are going to talk about vaccines. Don't go away. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration, plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and today we are speaking to Dr. Ritu Jane. And now, Vaccines. Obviously, you're not, or maybe you are in the position of sometimes giving vaccines, but I like to ask everyone who's in a primary care role um, of any form or fashion what their views are on vaccines. And, you know, L.A., you are in something of an epicenter. Uh, There are definitely a fair number of anti-vaccine people within the L.A. area. Um, what's your take on the whole vaccine movement? Also, with a one-year-old, you're kind of in that uh, age bracket where people are probably talking a lot about vaccines. So right. what do you think about it from a mother maternal standpoint, from a physician standpoint? Um, I mean, just do it. That, that's my take on it. Um, there's really no debate for me. It's not a point of contention. It is absolutely evidence-based. And um, there's no reason, in, at least in my world or hopefully in anyone's world, where vaccines are not given. Um, my, my personal take on it as a mother is um, I'm going to do everything that I can for my child to prevent illnesses, ones that we have taken so many years and so much research to do and to, to finally have a vaccine that may prevent something um, grave from happening. Of course, I'm going to give that to my child. Um, and for my neighbors and my friends, I recommend the same. Um, I wouldn't want a child to get sick from a preventable illness. Uh, that just feels um, unjust and it feels unfair because the child wasn't able to make that decision for himself. Um, so short of getting very, very heated and very controversial, um, I think I'll take it back into the physician side, which is um, it's absolutely evidence-based. Um, the claims that vaccines can cause other issues are have been debunked multiple times, and um, there's overwhelmingly strong evidence that vaccines work and vaccines save lives. Um, so just do them. That's it. 
and did you in LA the flu season I mean you must still have a flu season um, despite fact, it being better weather than here in fact we still have patients with flu um, so it, the flu season is sort of still happening it's lingering this year and yeah. you must have had to admit people so it's been it was a very terrible flu season um, you know I had very young otherwise very healthy patients um, you know, in the ICU, I had a 30 something year old in the ICU, otherwise very healthy. Um, he didn't make it because of, oh. flu. and I don't think that people understand how grave something like the flu can be, um, and how much of this can be prevented by a vaccine. It truly is life changing. Um, and it's, and it saved lives. So, um, that's why I feel so passionate about getting the word out and um, you know you get a lot of flack for it you do but if it means saving even one person I will do that um, but I it's, it's it's really really very potentially dangerous and especially if you have a young one at home so I agree completely I have I always get my vaccine and my kids get their flu shot and I got the flu because there are many strains and I was really sick but I did not need to be hospitalized and I got pneumonia it was really no fun but it really did still you know it occurred to me multiple times that had I not gotten the vaccine I would have been in the hospital in a millisecond you know like I felt pretty rotten but I could still function without the vaccine forget it I can't even imagine. You know, thank you for saying that. I, and I don't think that that is um, well understood by many people, which is, you know, it's not to say that you may not get the flu, but the idea is that if you have the flu vaccine, the course and the severity most often are decreased. Um, and so, so you may feel ill, but at least you're not in the AC on a ventilator fighting for your life. Um, right. So thank you for, for saying that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it, interestingly, there's a lot of in, more and more psychiatric literature coming out showing that there is a real risk for uh, one of the one of the risks for schizophrenia, as well as some other psychiatric illness is exposure to infection in utero one of the infections that has been studied repeatedly is the flu because it's right. something that causes high fever and it is preventable at least partially at least you know the highest fevers etc those are all preventable by virtue of getting a flu shot which is Absolutely. safe in pregnancy so get your flu shot at least next season if you didn't this year um <laughs> It's just, you know, and also, frankly, it's the it's the fair thing to do for kids, right? I mean, listeners know that, I mean, my kids are all vaccinated, but my youngest has uh, autoimmune stuff, and uh, I don't, you know, we haven't gotten her titers done recently, but it would not be unheard of that if her titers were not you know, up to snuff, so to speak, for MMR. I don't know yet, but I rely on herd immunity Absolutely. to keep her safe. And when people then choose not to vaccinate, that is that is putting my child at risk. Absolutely. And, you know, who gives anyone the right to do that? And uh, yeah. I don't think it does. And I mean, forget and taking my kid out of it because she does get vaccinated. How about the kids who really can't be vaccinated, right? The kids who Absolutely. have true medical contraindications, forget the religious exemptions, whatever. Because those, frankly, I think in general are not legitimate uh, from my understanding. Right. Like, it's really, I think it's unconscionable. I feel the same way. And um, 
for instance, you know, my, my son was just short of one years old before we went to Japan. Um, and thankfully, I was able to get the MMR vaccine for him. But we were considering maybe not even traveling or what if we had to? I mean, this is leisurely, but what if we had to go into an area um, where someone was not vaccinated and had the measles and my poor son who is not able to get the vaccine just yet because of age um, could potentially be exposed to that and that's my son but what if what if like you said someone who maybe has um, a suppressed immune system and is not able to get some of the live vaccines out there um, you know I think we owe it to the children of our community to vaccinate our own so that we can prevent, protect them. And we are running out of time, but I will say for everyone who says, um, you know, oh, well, we had the, you know, we had uh, chicken pox and we were fine. People, ki- kids die from chicken pox. Kids become neurologically, that, you know, incredibly uh, compromised for life. So chicken pox, not so benign. Anyway, sadly, we're leaving on a very sad note, but (laughs) thank you so much, Dr. Ritu Jane. Um, How can people find you? What's your Instagram handle? Yes, please. If you have any questions, have just want to say hello or have questions about travel or um, vaccines or health, um, I can be found at doctor, so it's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R dot Ritu, R-I-T-U, and that's my Instagram handle. Again, that's D-O-C-T-O-R dot R-I-T-U. Um, I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, um, I'd, I'd be happy to, to share in my motherhood and medicine and real estate journey with you all. And it's a it's a great Instagram Hey, I, I am not a great Instagrammer, but I did check it out and I thought it was awesome. So definitely check it out yourself. Remember, if you missed any of this show, you can always download it as a podcast along with prior episodes. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Until next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.